been talking about. Am I loud and clear, Kushal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying not to talk too loud here. Right. So, um, we're going to be speaking about something which is uh, recently gained popularity in India. It's been there for a while, but recently I think more and more surgeons are adopting it, and more and more patients are also asking for it. So, we're going to be talking about anteromedial osteoarthritis and uh, partial knee replacement surgery. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. You're able to see my screen. Yes, yes. Right. <clears throat> so I'm Dr. Adesh Anakaradi. I'm a knee and hip replacement surgeon at Sunshine Bone Joint Institute. I also do a lot of partial knee replacements. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So you have got knee corner and knee arthroplasty. All you need to know. So also known as partial knee replacement. Right. Right. So first, we need to ask ourselves, what is a silicon and arthroplasty? What is partial knee replacement? So you're replacing only the medial compartment of the knee joint. Only the medial compartment of the knee joint. It doesn't disturb the unaffected compartment, so you're not... Sir, your voice compartment. is not clear. Oh, is it? Okay. I thought you said it is very clear. Clear, but I'm talking out a bit loud, others. It's too faint, is it? Okay, I'll speak a little louder. So you're replacing only the medial compartment of the knee joint. Doesn't affect the unaffected compartment. It doesn't disturb any of the ligaments. That's an important point over here. And you're basically resurfacing the worn out portion and restoring the original joint space and ligament tautness. That is what a partial knee replacement is. It's so a lot of people think it is half a knee replacement. It's not really the case. It's more of a resurfacement of the knee joint, of the worn out part. So what are the indications for a unicondal knee arthroplasty? Anteromedial osteoarthritis, anteromedial osteoarthritis, anteromedial osteoarthritis. We call it as AMOA. So there's only one indication. Try not to extend your indications past this because the, the good results, the good results of a partial knee replacement are solely dependent on the right selection of your patient. So that's very, very important. Another a rare indication is probably a sonk, which is an osteonecrosis of the medial compartment of the knee. It is very, very rare. <clears throat> so now we ask ourselves, what is this AMO? We're talking about anteromedial osteoarthritis, but how do you define it? It's arthritis involving only the anterior up to the middle portion of the medial tibial condyle and the corresponding area on the medial condyle of the distal femur. So basically, you're talking about the medial condyle. Even that is in the anterior portion. So one thing in front of the middle, and this medial part. And it's always associated with an intact ACL. That's a very, very important point that you have to notice. It's because of that ACL that this arthritis is not spreading posteriorly and to the lateral compartment. So this term AMOA was first used in 1991. It was uh, by White and Goodfellow in this paper uh, in the field uh, Oxford group. And uh, it's from then onward it's been used very, very rampantly. In fact, it's now entered the lexicon the new classification of varus knee in 2016 with the and Parvizi. It's one of the classifications of varus knees, that is AMOA with an intact ACL. So it is now definitely in the mainstream lexicon. So why do we bother? So when you have good TKR implants all over, you have all different companies, you have rotating platforms, you have now the medial pivot knees, so many beautiful implants. Why even bother with this half a knee, right? So there are many reasons for this. So you're not replacing more of a damaged joint than is necessary. So you're preserving bone stock. So this will help in definitely younger patients who have only medial arthritis. The function following a successful uni tends to be better than that of TKR. Range of motion is greater. The gait is near normal and demanding activities like stairs descent have better outcomes because of the myomechanics being restored because we are not touching any of the ligaments. It's reduced morbidity and mortality. So it's also a good indication for older patients as well. And the hospital stay is also shorter. And revision after a partial knee is better than that after a total knee replacement. So these are all the different kinds of papers you can read for the benefits of partial knee replacement. So what is the satisfaction like after TKR? We know this, there are all these papers being quoted nowadays, about only 20% being satisfied. Right? So could this be because of wrong surgery for the wrong patient? So we did our own study to see TKR versus unicornarin and anteromedial osteoarthritis. And we found that 
definitely the patients getting partial knee for AMOA are probably doing better than patients getting PKR in AMOA. So probably we're doing the wrong surgery for patients with just uh, localized medial arthritis. So what are the different types of unis? If you're looking about whether it's fixed or mobile, you have the mobile bearing, which is Oxford. As far as I know, that's the only uh, widely used mobile bearing uh, partial knee replacement. Then there's a the fixed bearing. You have many like PFC, PFC Sigma, and you have the Vistoris by uh, Striker. And now we have a lot of uh, people are now doing the robotic surgeries, that is Vistoris and Journey knees. Depends on which robot you have, you can use that particular partial knee. So, but all the consensus, all the different studies have shown that fixed bearing and mobile bearing have comparable results. So you don't really have to stress too much about which type you're using. If you're trained in one particular type, just go ahead and do those. So as I mentioned, all the different companies also have their own unicondar implants, Esquilab, Depu, Smith & Nephew, Link, Striker. They're all good. And But I'll be speaking specifically about Oxford and the Striker Restorist because these are the two that I, I perform. So let's start off with the Oxford knee. It is a mobile bearing uni. This is all my conventional unis are done with this. Uh, it has gone through four phases of development. There's a phase one, then the phase two, they've made it more circumferential and they, they introduced something called as distal mean. Earlier the distal femur was cut, now it started to get milled. Phase three is called the micro in, in instrumentation. And then phase four is called the microplasty where it has two pegs instead of one to give it more rotational stability. So this is the present iteration of the Oxford, the fourth generation. So before you head over to this, you need to understand the correct indications. It's very important you choose the right patients. So the prerequisites for considering UK, I call it the divine law for UK. One is medial bone on bone arthritis. Everybody please take a screenshot of this slide. One is medial bone on bone arthritis. You should see that this bone and this bone are touching. That's very, very important. If you're not having medial bone and bone arthritis, you're not going to have great results. Next, your full cartilage thickness in the lateral compartment of the knee is very important. You should see that there is no wear in the lateral compartment whatsoever. Next is an intact and a fully functional ACL. That's very important. I'll explain why the ACL is so important. But if your ACL is not intact, your arthritis is going to spread to another compartment and your partially replacement is not going to last long. An intact MCL is obvious and finally a correctable varus deformity which proves that your MCL is not contracted because you are not doing any soft tissue release in a partial knee. So these are the five uh, laws which should not be broken for doing a partial knee replacement surgery. You can take a screenshot of this slide. So let's explain the AMOA findings. An intact cruciate maintains a normal femoral roll back. So let's say this particular patient has anterior medial osteoarthritis over here on the tibia. The same uh, serrated bone, same eburnated bone starts rubbing against the femur, anterior part of the femur and causes wear out. So this causes medial osteoarthritis and a varus deformity. The lateral compartment, if you see, the cartilage is still intact. Now what happens if these cruciates are still intact, when this patient flexes, the ro normal rollback is maintained in the femur and that causes the normal cartilage which is not hibernated from touching the normal cartilage. So there's no wear on the posterior aspect over here. So you can see over here, there's no wear over here. So that's why intact cartilage prevents this arthritis from moving backwards. And is also why the varus deformity corrects inflection. When you flex, the intact cartilage comes in contact with intact cartilage and so your varus deformity disappears. So so now let's see what happens when your ACL is gone. When the ACL deficient virus knee is located around four millimeters more posterior on the medial plateau than where in ACL intact. This is a study. Basically, they found that ACL deficient knees, the wear pattern spread four millimeters posterior on the medial plateau. So what happens is the failure of the ACL leads to original lesions in the extension areas of the medial compartment to cause secondary damage on the flexion area. So what that means is when this guy is flexing, there's no longer any rollback. So this hibernated anterior part of the tibia starts to wear out the posterior part of the femur as well. And that in turn wears out the posterior part of the tibia. So that's what happens when the ACL gets deficient. So now let's talk about contraindications for unis. So obviously, if you're choosing the right patients, that means you're following the contraindications properly. So the converse of all our indications, that is lateral compartment OA, an absent or severely damaged ACL, damaged MCL, sense of medial bone on bone arthritis. Now this is something can be contentious. 
But the point I'm trying to make is if they're having so much of pain without having one on one arthritis, the pain is probably coming from somewhere else. So you doing a partial replacement is not going to give that patient pain relief. Next, a non-correctable varus deformity means there's a contracted MCL. So that means you're going to have to do soft tissue release, which is not indicated in a partial knee. And of course, inflammatory arthritis, because that inflammation is going to spread to the other compartment in due course of time. We had one lady who was a doctor herself who had a partial knee done in uh, Kolkata. She had proper indications, but she was diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis after the surgery was done. And within five years, she came to us for revision because the arthritis had spread to the lateral compartment. So make sure if you have any doubt of inflammation, any young patient with arthritis, just get an inflammatory checkup done. Maybe a rheumatoid factor on HLA B27. You can just get those to roll out the rheumatoid <coughs> arthritis. So there's this old paper in 1989 by Cozen and Scott, which they showed all these contraindications for unis as well. Young age, high activity level, obesity, patellofemoral joint arthritis, and lateral osteoporosis. If you think about it, if you take all these contraindications, no patient will ever get a uni done. And many of the naysayers of, I mean, of partial knees, they used to quote this paper to show that, you know, we should not be doing unis. But all the recent studies have shown that these no longer hold good for unicondyls. So you can do unis in young age, high activity levels, obese patients, PFJ arthritis, and natural osteopathy. These are all the papers which are proving that as well. So another question a lot of people ask is, is uni part of a spectrum of treatment of arthritis? What I mean to say, they say, should you do HDO first? And then if that fails, go to uni. And if that fails, go to free care. Not necessarily. First of all, try to remember that uni is not a precursor or a gap filling for a total knee replacement. It is an end surgery if you choose the patient's correct. Secondly, the indications for a uni versus HDO are actually different from each other. So you look at this slide over here. If you see, there are also many overlapping patients who could do both. Probably if you are better at one particular procedure, do that. But if you have a profile of a patient where, look at this side, a male, young, lean, heavy labor, activity-related discomfort, extra articular deformity, and almost bone on bone, not bone on bone arthritis, you can lean towards an HDO. But if you have somebody on this side, like a female, obese, medial focal pain, even on mild activity, pain on resting also, no extra articular deformity, and complete bone on bone arthritis, you can probably lean towards a uni. You can overlap, doesn't mean that only you have to do a HDO for these kind of patients. The only uni for these is just if you have a dilemma between the two, you just take these criteria into mind. Now let's look at the clinical features of AMO. <clears throat> so a patient has pain in the knee joint, usually confined to the medial side. So when you ask a patient about their pain, they will point to this area over there. Uh, one second. Yeah. So they usually point out, they'll have a pinpoint tenderness. If you have a patient who has that weight complaint saying they have pain all over the knee joint, don't consider a unicorn. Secondly, they have a virus deformity on standing, but the virus gets corrected while sitting because of the intact cartilage. Hey, intact cartilage can cause the uh, disappearance of this virus deformity. Now look at the anatomical features of an AMO. So these are the tibial biscuits of some AMOA cases. You see the posterior cartilage is always intact always in fact, this proves that this is a proper AMOA, okay? And you see the anterior part, anything past the center is all hibernated and worn away. So that is what are typical findings of an AMOA. Now, now the next important thing you have to know about is the Oxford radiological criteria for selection of patients with partial, selection of patients for unicornal arthroplasty. You have to take AP view in a virus test, AP view with the valgus test and a lateral view. And virus test, you should see complete one on one uh, articulation of the medial compartment. So it should be loss of complete medial joint space. The valgus test should show no reduction in the lateral compartment space. And the lateral view gives you some idea about whether the cell is intact or not, which I will show you. So the position of the x ray, put in slight 20 degrees of flexion of the knee, and the x ray beam comes at around 10 degrees of cordite tilt, like this. Okay? This gives you the best view. And you get virus and valgus test success. So this is a valgus test. There is no reduction in the lateral joint space. The virus test shows bone on bone arthritis. And the lateral view, you should see the small bump at the back of the tibia, which shows that the ACL and the cartilage is still intact. So the other few pictures of lateral view. So these two 
are ACL intact. You can see this is a nice bump. So this is this is posterior here, and this is anterior. Okay, so you see this this is the worn out part, and this is a nice bump over here. This is a nice curve over here. ACL absent, this worn out part goes all the way to the back. That's the difference between an ACL intact and ACL absent lateral view. So now let's move on to the surgical steps upon Oxford. Now, you have, there are two ways to do this. You can either use this hanging leg position. There's a hanging leg a beam like this where you can hang the leg over the table. I usually do it with a regular TKR positioning with a normal sandbag and a side support and dangle the leg in certain steps. That's because the gravity has to come into play when you're doing your balancing part. Okay, so either you can use this leg dangler or you can just do a regular TKR and just dangle the leg with the assistant cell during those particular steps. Now, the incision, it's a parameter skin incision. So usually our skin incision is central, but our arthrotomy is paramedial. But here, your incision itself is paramedial. You can see it's slightly medial. Okay, so it goes above from the uh, incision from above the medial pole of the patella to three centimeters distant to the joint line just medial to the tibial tuberosa. So it's a much more medial incision and a much smaller incision. A normal incision comes from here to here, but here it's only this much, okay? So the, it comes up to two thirds above the joint line and one third below. So only the obscuring fat and anterior portion of the medial meniscus is incised. You don't need to take out the whole fat fat, only whatever comes in your way. Now, it's always very, very important to get a quick inspection of your findings. Always check for bone on bone arthritis, full thickness cartilage on the lateral condyle, and ACL is intact or not, check it with the ACL hook. So this is what it looks like. I hope you can see this video. Look in, you find that medial arthritis, check the ACL is intact, and check for pristine cartilage. Is the video playing, guys? Yes, sir. It's playing. Perfect. And you also take a quick glance to see if there's any patellofemoral joint arthritis in this area over here. If you have a small ulcer, it's okay. But if you have a very deep, you know, grade four uh, arthritis on the patella, you want to avoid doing partially in that case. So next very important step is removal of the osteophytes. So you have to remove the anterior tibial, the medial femoral, and the notch osteophytes. There's something called as an anvil osteophyte over here has to be removed. And you can disregard any lateral osteophytes. You don't need to read it there. So this is what your osteophytes look like. Take off all your medial osteophytes. Take out this notch osteophyte, it's very important because this notch osteophyte will in due course of time remove the ACL. And then this annual osteophyte, which will prevent full extension. So you take that off. Now, something called as the femoral uh, sizing spoon is very important. So the sizing spoon is inserted along the posterior femoral part line. To just tighten the intact MCL. Can we assess by twisting the spoon not more than 20 degrees still? What that means is this is a sizing spoon. You Curve it behind the femoral condyle over here, and you should get so on the correct spoon should just have this much of play over here. This is where the cartilage would have been, if it were not worn out. So it should be resting like that. The correct size should be around three to five mm off the eburnated surface where the intact cartilage would have been. This is your correct sizing of the spoon. After you've done that, put the right spoon in. You have to apply something called like a tibial saw guide. So there's something called as a G clamp. Because it's of shape, it's called a G clamp. It attached to the extramedially tibial saw guide along the shaft of the tibia. I'm going to show you in this video as well. And uh, fundamentally means we are cutting the proximal tibia after tightening the MCL with the sizing spoon. So this is what it looks like. The spoon comes in. You're tightening your, you're tightening your MCL. And this is the extramedially tibial guide. And this is a G clamp which attaches to the spoon and attaches to the extramedially tibial guide, and then you lock it down. And this is how you, your level of a tibial cut is determined. Next, after you put in this uh, tibial guide, you have to use a reciprocating vertical. So the first cut is the vertical tibial cut. This is the cut which gives us palpitations because you don't want to go too deep. That's very, very important. Using a reciprocating vertical saw, just medium to the medial tibial spine. There's no G here. You find the medial most part of the medial spine. And just go medial to it. Direction in the plane of flexion extension of the limb or towards the ipsilateral ACL. Okay, you can take off a few of the medial most fibers of the ACL around here, no issue, because you need to lateralize as much as possible and saw down till the surface of the saw guide, only till here. 
and it should never be too deep. You never cut deeper than the jig, otherwise you'll get stress fractures. So this is what it looks like. The saw guide comes in, then you go straight down until you reach the top surface of the jig. Okay, that's a vertical tibial cut. Next is the horizontal tibial cut. This tibial biscuit should come out as a whole. So this is what happens. You put in an MCL retractor, then you get your horizontal blade in, and you can go and take your horizontal cut of your biscuit. You can use a sorted uh, guide as well, sorted jig. Once you've done that cut, you take out the whole tibial biscuit as a whole. And you just recheck whether this is a proper AMO or not. You see this one? The cartridge is intact at the back. Next, you have to do your femoral drill hole. The hole is made into the intermediary canal of the femur. If you notice, this is much the normal TKR intermediary holes here. Come more medial than that. You can say it's along the uh, lateral border of the medial corner. You get a hole over here. Okay. And then the intermediary rod is inserted over here. It helps to direct the femoral implant and also helps in detracting the patella. Next, you have to do your posterior femoral cut. So your tibial cut is done. Now you're going to start your posterior femoral cut. So you insert an appropriate femoral drill guide. So this is called a drill guide. Okay. And uh, it corresponds to your G clamp size that you used in the beginning. You link it to the intermediary rod and you make drill holes for both the pegs. The femoral dissection guide is inserted into the holes and protect the MCN and cut the posterior femur with the horizontal oscillating blade. So just watch the video. So this goes in, this is the drill guide. You link it to your intermediary rod. Then you put, make it drill holes, one in the top, <clears throat> one in the bottom. Okay, and then you take these out. You take out this femoral drill guide, you insert your reception guide, femoral reception guide with two pegs, protect your MCL, and then you take your posterior femoral cut. You have to make sure that you're not skiving off the cartilage or the sclerotic bone. Take a nice cut, take out your guide, reception guide, with the extractor, and then take out your posterior femoral biscuit. Now you have your infection gap is finally created. This the amount uh, corresponds to your posterior femoral thickness. Okay? So now you do something called as a digital femoral minimum. So now you have a flexion gap. You need to create an extension gap, just like a TKR. But this is not done with a saw like we do in a TKR. We do something called as a milling. We use something called as a figure. This is called as a figure. Sits into the central hole, peg like hole of the femur. And then you get a mill which comes over it and mills out. So see what happens. So this goes over. It mills away the distal femur and until you go until your uh, trigger touches that. Then you put in your femoral pillar gauge in flexion as well as extension to see the discrepancy between flexion and extension. So I'm going to show you this again. Let's start this from the beginning. Your distal mill is done. This is the zero spigot. It's a zero station mill. So you've created a minimum extension gap. You put in your trial implant. You put your joint into flexion. So this is a four size femur, four size uh, feeler gauge. You put it in flexion because your cut was four with the four G clamp. So your femur flexion size is four. Okay. Then you check your extension gap by extending it and checking with the one spoon. So even the one spoon is not going in. So that's a zero gap in extension. So now understand this. Your flexion gap is four. Your extension gap is zero. So how much more you have to mill to balance the two? Four minus zero, which is equal to four. So you need to mill your distal femur four millimeters deeper. So what you do, you take a force figure, which allows your mill to go even deeper than before. And you mill out the remaining part of the distal femur. And now you can get a feeler gauge of four in flexion. And the same fourth size should go in extension as well. Now it's beautifully balanced in flexion and extension. That's how you balance your flexion extension gaps in a Oxford joint. So once you've finished your balancing part, you have to now prepare the tibial plateau. Appropriate size template is inserted. So you have different sizes of these uh, tibial base plates. Sit against the vertical cut and brought forward with a hook over the posterior aspect. The keel cut saw borrows into the keel slot and the template is removed and the tile inserted. See what happens. You put in your proper size. Then you get this hook to go to the back. Take it over the posterior edge and pull it forwards. Hold it with this pin. 
and then you take this something called as a toothbrush saw and it goes into the keel creates your keel okay you're able to see this i hope and you can see this in this picture as well and once that is prepared <clears throat> whole construct is taken out Okay, and now you have your keel is uh, prepared. You take out the remaining bone with this digger. And once that is done, you put in your trial implant. Your trial, you hammer it in with this punch. And then you put in your femoral implant, femoral trial as well. So, Human size is determined as for the tibial size. The trial is inserted and the trial poly is inserted. It should pop in without too much of force. Now, remember in the mobile bearing, it should neither be too tight nor too loose. If you're too loose, your poly can spin out. If you're too tight, you can put undue pressure in the lateral compartment. So, once you're done, put in the cement and implantation. Remove all the trials, paste the cement onto the tibial surface, insert your implants, put your gap gauge until the cement sets, and put your final poly and close. This is what your X-ray should look like. In the anterior view, you should see your vertical part of your implant just sitting against this vertical part of the crest. It's okay, and then your femur should also look like this pocket seat. In the lateral view, you should see that it's nicely snugly fitting. So now let's go to some recent advances in Unicom. Then. That is robot assisted striker mycoplasty. I'm talking specifically about the striker uni. Um, why robotic? Because there are challenging there are a lot of challenges of partial age. It's not an easy surgery to do. To get accurate component positioning, soft tissue balancing, and limb alignment. So there's a lot of calculations to be done to get a good uni, right? So if you now you can use the Mako Restorus MCK, okay? It's a striker implant and it's a fixed bearing. So the difference is between this and the Oxford. All the robotic companies are now coming with unis as well. It's not just the striker, but I'm speaking specifically about this. The core features of the Mako partially, you have an enhanced planning. You can plan the case beforehand, then you can do dynamic joint balancing and then haptic guidance where you can execute your cuts and your burring without going into the normal tissue. If you zoom in a little more in the workflow, do a pre-op plan, you place these things known as arrays so the robot can see where your limb is. You do bone registration, balance the gaps, then you map the cartilage, and then you do something like start tracking. Tracking to make sure there's no edge story. Can you guys hear me or is it too loud? Can you go to a different area? So, guys? Fine, sir. It's okay? Right. right. Then you do the implant tracking to make sure there's no edge loading. You have central tracking implant. And then you resect your bone with the help of the robot. So, CT based way of planning. So, this is a CT based robot. So, the CT data is segmented to create a 3D anatomy of each patient's anatomy. And then you plan your sizing of the implant. Both tibia and femur can be planned according to that patient's bones. Then you do your joint balancing where you take your, your knee through an arc of motion. And then you see how much you are in each pose kept at 10 degrees, at 45 degrees, at 90 degrees, and at 120 degrees. You should try to get say anything below this line over here is tight. Anything above is loose. So you need to aim for 1 to 1.5 mm loose in all these four captures. You should aim for this. So how you do that? You have this big table. So something known as functional positioning of the implants. So I'm not going to go too much of that. But if you go here, just by anteriorizing my femoral component, I can increase my flexion gap. Just by making my tibial component a little less proud, I can increase all my flexion and extension. So there's a lot of playing around that you can do. You can just take a screenshot of this if you want. Uh, it comes into handy when you're doing these robotic cases. Now, after you've balanced out your graph, so the importance of this balancing step is you can prevent overstuffing. That's very, very important. I'll explain in the complications page why overstuffing can cause lateral arthritis. But then you can do something called as cartilage mapping, where you show the robot where the intact cartilage is, and you try to match your implant to that cartilage line so that there's no jump of the patella when you're going from flexion to extension. Then uh, I mentioned about implant tracking already. You know that? No, I didn't mention about implant tracking. So here, this step ensures no edge loading. So it shows that you are, because see, in a, 
in a mobile bearing uni the poly moves along the implant with through flexion and extension so you don't have an issue of uh, you don't have an issue of uh, edge loading um so but here because it's a fixed bearing implant you can have a issue of edge loading if you don't have your centrally tracking implants so you what you can do is if you find that these red dots are basically the center of the tibia on the femur in that particular pose so this is a very nicely centrally tracking joint let's say these red dots are over here that means the femur is too medial and the tibia is too lateral so what you can do is you can lateralize my femur until it comes to this area without going into the intercondylar notch and i can make sure that these dots become centralized or i can medialize my tibia that's another way to do it so this is ways to improve the implant tracking with the robotic cases then of course there's the bone preparation the robotic arm helps to resect the femur and tibial surfaces within your haptic bond so this is screen please this is what it looks like while i'm burning away i'm looking at the screen the burr helps me to make sure that i'm not going outside my haptic bond and i'm very safe the post op x rays they are 100% look good so the oxford the beautiful implant a beautiful surgery but it's very variable if the surgeon surgeon is not experienced or in that particular day you didn't have a good day your x rays can be you know iffy but if you go for your mapo uh, you know, or any robotic for that matter you always 99.9% you'll always get perfect x rays like this so it has been proven that the Mako or the robotic unis have much more accuracy in all the planes: femoral sagittal, femoral coronal, femoral axial, tibial sagittal, tibial coronal, and tibial axial. The orange bars are the accuracy of the Mako versus accuracy in the manual, which is great. And you can see it's more accurate in all six planes. The much lower revision rates, Mako partial knee. These are again different papers from Stryker. And uh, if you see RAP, this is RAP car means robotic assisted partial knee arthroplasty. RAP car we call it. What is conventional uni of reduced post-op pain, reduced analgesia requirement, shorter time to stay awake, raising, decreased number of physiotherapy sessions, improved maximum knee flexion, and reduced time to discharge. Now, partial knee replacement doesn't only mean medial, but in India, predominantly we do medial arthritis because that's what we get various knees. Abroad, they do a lot of lateral uh, unis as well, so like this, and you, so a lot of people do patellofemoral uh, joint replacements as well. You can be doing doing these with the Mako. some people also do this bi compartmental where you are replacing the patellar femur as well as the medial compartment so let's talk about outcomes of uni in general okay so a lot of people don't do unis because they feel that the outcomes are not great but that's not actually true it's been proven i mean again especially by the oxford group that if you are a well trained surgeon who has done enough for number of joints you are going to have much better results and probably the bad results are coming from inexperienced surgeons and in the old and older uh, designs which were not very very uh, sturdy so the studies show around 98% survivorship at 6 years in a case of 1500 unis another study 91% at 20 years uh, in a follow up in 682 cases these are two studies you can have a look at and all these studies show very very good results this is from the oxford book written by john goodfellow uh, it's a very lovely book i would like you to have a look through that book if you can get access to it John Goodfellow and John O'Connor. These, this is a, these are the authors. It's the Oxford Guide to Partial Knee Replacement. Um, it will give you your overall concepts of unis. It may not tell you how to do a robotic, but it will give you your overall concepts of indications, contraindications, and why the ACL is important, etc., etc. So these are the studies which showed very, very good results. Just to show you our own results. This is a gentleman who had bilateral partial knees with just two to three weeks ago, and he is walking very well. And see, they have on almost normal gait because you're not touching the ligaments, you're not changing the biomechanics of the knee at all. And um, see the range of motion how it is, and the straight leg raising is beautiful. This gentleman, uh, he was, he is a shop owner. He's able to walk. See the climbing of stairs up and down, so beautiful. This is he sent this one month post op. Now when we got robotic partial knees, that we see even faster recovery. This is day two. This lady is sitting on the floor and chatting with our boss. And this is when we were sold on robotic partial knees. This gentleman is a 90-year-old who sent me this a week after surgery bilateral robotic partial knee. And this man uh, is an uh, 85-year-old wanting to play golf. He had a meniscus injury, and he just uh, wanted to see whether we can get a 
meniscectomy done or meniscal repair but i saw that he had medial arthritis so i replaced his uh, i did a partial knee replacement for him with the robotics and he's able to get back to golf again and he is doing all the pivoting movements that he needs for his sport oh, now let's go about complications i've spoken about all the great things about the knees but there are complications that's the reason why we get a lot of people get scared to do it one is medial tibial plateau fractures and the reason for that is when you if you take your vertical cut lower than the level that is at the level of the jig you are going to have such a tremendous rise in pressure look at this this cut causes this cut see how much of pressure is there see that this stress riser here it's almost come to you have pretty got to have a medial tibial fracture uh, cut of fracture in this case to make sure that your vertical cut is not too deep also when you are banging down on the implant make sure that you are not using too much of force because your force is completely uh is your constraint on your medial condyle and is it unlike a tcar but it's evenly distributed to both the condyles second is loosening of the implant where lateral compartment arthritis can happen if you have a very tight body so this look at this now this particular picture let's say you overstuck this medial compartment this distractive forces in the medial compartment become compressive forces in the lateral compartment leading to lateral arthritis it's very important that you don't overstuff your joint then you have something called as a poly spin out uh, it's not mentioned here so the next the next com uh, complication is a poly spin out if you have too loose a joint what happens is your polyethylene can actually spin out in a uh, mobile bearing um, uniform so so let's see this few complications that i've had in my practice so let's see this patient had a proper bone on bone arthritis you see over here and no reduction in the lateral joint space okay so went ahead and did a uni she was a pretty obese lady and uh, looked all good then after two weeks disaster strikes she came back a lot of pain and then we found that she had a medial condyle fracture two weeks later the other side was doing very well but this side she had a big fracture so we went in how do you re revise such a case what do you do in such an incident so we took we went in with a trauma surgeon help we opened up we, we had to take out this piece of bone and we ended up doing a revision total knee replacement with a wedge as well as a rod and a plate support over here so not every uni revision requires this so you can get away with a regular primary tcar as well but here because she had a big condyle fracture we had after four months she's doing well now she's doing much much better but this can happen we just wanted to let you know about it now let's look at another case again typical uh, bone on bone arthritis we went ahead and did it uni and one year post up she comes saying that i feel a little weird and can you guys see what's wrong over here is to implants are touching and you can see this polyethylene is actually lying on the side so this is what the poly looks like here. this is the poly lying on the side so this is called a poly spin out so you see she looks normal over here yeah, but she has a bit of a varus thrust you can see there so we went in you see the varus thrust there and you can see but doesn't look too bad in the sagittal view so we want to open it up and we were very surprised to find that the poly is actually reduced but it is back to front so it somehow auto reduced itself but definitely we can't leave it like that so we went ahead we went through the arco motion to see what's going on we distracted we pulled out the poly so probably either the poly we put in initially was too thin or her ligaments are stretched out or something has happened in due course of time and made her joint more lax and caused the poly spin out so what we did we pulled out the poly it is easily coming out and we found the space we need to check whether everything else is fine the ligaments are okay and the implants are still well fixed so we went with a thicker poly we placed in a thicker poly we went as high as we could go to see how which gives the best stability okay and we found that after upsizing by two poly sizes we got a good stable joint and we put it in and we had a nice stable joint without any varus thrust thrust anymore so we hope for the best this is a post op x-ray still doesn't look very very normal but at least this lady was walking and she hasn't come back yet so either she's doing well or she's decided that we are buggering up her knee and it's gone somewhere else okay so so our revision rates high and why
So a lot of people say that you need to conduct revision rates at very high. A few studies in joint registry show revision rates of UK to be higher than those of TK. This is due to a lower threshold to revise units. Now, if you get a patient who comes to you with a partial knee replacement, first thing you'd say is, I've never seen this, so I'm not happy with this. If you see that patient has pain, especially done with somebody else, you're going to jump to revise it and say, listen, you probably didn't get a good joint. You should probably get a total replacement and revise it. Right? But if you have a same patient who comes with a TKR which has a lot of pain, you're going to wait. You're going to ask him to wait for another one or two months before revising that joint. So your threshold for revision of unis is definitely less. And then there's this paper by Mare et al. Uh, where they studied and they found that um, the best results of unis are when the surgeon's practice comprises about 20% of unis. This is very, very interesting, this table over here. So the revision rates, this is the revision rates. This is the number of the percentage of their practice, which is unis. So if you're less than 20%, you have very high revision rates because you're not, yeah. you're probably not experienced enough. Now, if you're more than 50%, again, your revision rate starts to climb, probably because you're over-indicating. So your sweet spot is between 20% to 45% of your cases. If they're unis, you're probably doing a good number, enough to have good surgical technique, and you're not over-indicating your unis. So probably an ideal situation is having 20% of your practice as unis if you're selecting them correctly. We did our own study where we published this study, where we studied more than 2,500 joints who underwent TKR. So TKR joints, 2,500 joints. We studied every single joint. We studied the, uh, the wear pattern. We put them on uh, graph paper like this to study whether arthritis is spreading to the back or not, or whether it's, of course, these are only medial arthritis patients and whether the ACL was intact or not, to study how many of these TKRs were amenable for a uni. And we found a staggering 46% of these patients were amenable for uni. They were matching the Oxford criteria. So this definitely means that we are definitely, we are underutilizing this procedure. Probably many, many more cases can be done with this beautiful procedure. So this is a paper if you want to go through it. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We'll stop sharing. Wonderful presentation, Agus. Thank you, ma'am. I hope uh, the concepts are clear. Let me know yeah, if you have any questions yeah. or any doubts. Yes, clear. Yeah, everyone, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everyone, uh, a knee replacement surgeon, should be knowing and able to do a partial knee replacement as well. Because there are indications, and it's a beautiful operation in selective patients, and it is a slightly learning curve is more, but you should learn. You should not be close to that. In fact, I would say a complete knee surgeon should be able to know high tibial osteotomy, partial knee replacement, and total knee replacement. Because there are some patients, for example, uh, too young, around 45, 50, they are very severe arthritis. You can offer them partial knee, which can serve them 10, 15 years, and then they can go into total knee. Like that second cohort of patients, 70, 80 plus patients, the AMOA, the best treatment is the partial knee replacement. There's very simple, and the complications are very less, and patients' outcomes are very good. So when you start partial knee, start with the old patients, 70 plus, see that the unicornular play uh, after it is there and do that. So the uh, you are saying 15 years, but a lot of studies are showing more than 20 years of survivorship. So I mean, I think it's an end surgery if you are choosing a patient's right. Of course, it lasts as long as a TKR in many many of the studies that I have shown today. So you don't really have to show it as a stopgap surgery either. Second thing is, even if you are not doing the surgeries, you should know about them. You should know about the results so that. You don't tell a patient who comes to you with a uni x-ray that, hey, you shouldn't have gotten this done. At least know that. If you're not doing them, at least know that there are good results with them. Any questions? There's no question on the chat box. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So, uh, say a 45, 50-year-old who you've operated for a total knee and a partial knee, two different patients... Yeah. Two different patients. Okay. Yeah, two different patients. Any difference in the activity level that you will restrict? Like say sports, example, tennis specifically. 
would you allow your passing me guy or what would you do i will allow him to play so the whole point of passing is you should get let them get back to as normal a lifestyle as possible so i really wouldn't mind them going back to sports to tell you the truth uh there was a lady who had done she was a bank manager she was only 44 years old she used to play badminton with her kids and she asked whether i can get back to doing it she's doing it she's enjoying her badminton so you are probably asking because you want to see whether it's going to last or not right yeah so is, yeah well if you're going to you're going to uh, retain your ligaments and all that you should let them get back to normal and second question do we know any is there any correlation or can we predict who goes into amo um and who goes into tri compartmental i don't think there's like any way to predict it no it's, it's very predictors. strange like boeing I, or uh, i don't know there are some patients at the age of 85 you would expect complete tri compartmental they have proper amo in that case only the anterior medial part is gone then you have some young patients who not even an infirmity that is and they have a tri compartmental it's really yeah. difficult to say who gets what i don't know who gets what but it's very typical you see a guy who comes and says um i have pain exactly over right. here and not the guys who say i have pain all over those are the ones who have typical ama other can i ask you a question yes doctor Abhay, please yeah. uh, the case which you showed uh, you revised that case uh huh so, the uh, ucr case uh, revision you showed yeah yeah so, okay but uh, had you discussed the converting it to a total knee replacement or uh, you hadn't thought of that during that case we had converted total knee so you're talking about the tibial fracture one no no, no the one which where you just exchange the poly uh, the poly spin out yeah so yeah, we have given a chance for the uh, for retaining the the uni because the implants were very well fixed there was nothing wrong there we we were not sure why it spun out in the first place maybe her mcl stretched out because of whatever reason so we we gave it a chance for uh, just by increasing the poly so if if she comes back again with another episode we should definitely take it out and put a total knee for sure but we gave it a chance you know it's a simple, smaller procedure much more bone preserving if it works it works she's very happy that's the reason and she was actually happy for all year before that somehow that spun out after a year so that's the reason we gave it a chance with a higher size poly is there any difficulty to convert uk to total knee Uni- there isn't it's actually it's it's a quite a simple procedure to do uh, i last time also i showed a video on how to convert it um, i'll probably share it on the group we had one case who came to us uh, she had unexplained pain for like almost 6 months so we had to revise it and uh, the only thing you have to take into consideration there is leave your femoral implant in c2 because that's going to give you your basis for your distal femoral jig right so yeah. keep the implant in c2 then you take your cuts and then you take out your thing and you may feel that what about the tibia because it's a pretty low cut most of the time you can get away without even going for a higher size poly that cut is usually corresponding to your regular tibial cut maybe a millimeter or two more and then you can get away with a regular 10 poly or even sometimes a 9 poly so usually most of the time if it's a revision because of just spread of the arthritis in the other compartment or any other reason unexplained pain something is just not right you can get a primary tk if it's a fracture like i showed you because that whole condyle is gone you may have to go for a wedge with a rod but a regular conversion to just of an arthritis spreading to the other compartment you can get a primary tk adarsh intramedullary uh, road is advisable for converting to as I, as i said like the ones with the fem- uh, tibial condyle fracture yes because you uh, don't have okay, the medial well, that is okay yeah. a regular one you don't need okay. a rod can i ask a question sir femur side sir the femur side nothing it's nothing different there uh, you may have to just put in a bit of extra cement or sometimes a small wedge if required some other so you consider the quality okay. of bone before doing a uh, unique condyle sir quality of bone um, means osteoporosis very good question because yeah yeah uh, we don't usually do bone scans and all that for these um probably after that one incident i had with the tibial condyle fracture more than osteoporosis i'm a little wary of doing it in bmi more than 35 
more than osteoporosis is the weight which i feel is a bit more risky though the oxford group says there's no issue at all so i'm not doing it for more than 35 bmi anymore very obese lady with medial i'd rather still go for a tkr osteoporosis we don't really do much of a work up uh, before we doing unis so another, another question mri is done question, mri is done in yeah. routine cases to see lateral compartment yeah i no. never i have never done an mri instead i'd rather just keep a tkr back up then do an mri cuz i feel it's an over diagnosis mri sometimes we'll show acl so is rupture or something but it's are you required. doing arthroscopy arthroscopy examination before doing a partial no no, no. no. arthroscopy mri not required you don't in fact nowadays i'm not even getting the varus valgus knee x rays because i know what an amo x ray looks like now standing x ray just get varus okay, one more question yeah please please one more question sir one more question if you cut a little bit deep then you can put a anti glide plate uh, for the precaution of like like this <laughs> probably you can but rather than that i mean if you're going if you've gone too deep just convert it to tkr i think that's the safer thing to do um okay. see that for the conventional unis the most important step is your vertical cut that's where you have to be the most careful everything else will go fine it's just mm-hmm. that cut which is a difficult part because you don't have a jig and the moment you go down you see how much the stress riser comes so if you can be very very cautious in that step 90% of your case is done and the rest of it goes very smoothly like a symphony my i think i used to do my unis in like 25 minutes the oxfords 25 minutes skin to skin mm-hmm. so just have to be careful at that step especially so when you're using your saw mm-hmm. bring your saw down don't lift your elbow up the moment you lift your elbow up your saw goes deep and then you'll end up cutting Landing deep so you should come yeah. parallelly down like this okay sir uh, how many times you have changed the decision at the last stage intraoperative from ukr yeah. to dkr earlier days when we want to uh, good at choosing the right indicated patients a little more we probably changed around overall in my practice of more than i think we've done more than 350 to 400 units uh, we have changed probably around 10 and most of them were in the first few first 50 probably because initially we were not sure you know whether uh, we this is the right indication or not once you start doing more and more you realize that you know what are the right indications secondly you can also venture a bit more like if i have a bit of an ulcer on the patella femoral i still do a uni or if i find that there's a bit of fraying of the acl i still do uni in the earlier stages i'm a bit scared to do that but nowadays uh, i have extended my indications a little bit more with still good results sir, the sir how do you check that the femoral rotation the cn is more medial so hmm? is it difficult to convert ukr to tkr because you said the incision will be more yeah. medial as compared to the tkr not really if you have planned yeah. to switch at the later stage then it would could have been some difficulty yes. for that regarding the incision not really that incision it's a bit medial but it doesn't really you may have to just use bit more force with your home and that's it otherwise you're okay extend it both up and down slightly curved laterally you're okay so how do you check the femoral rotation means the coronary plane rotation like this? yeah uh, femoral rotation in an oxford is not you know something to be too worried about because it's a completely spherical implant so even if your femoral rotation is slightly 10 to 15 degrees internal rotator or external rotator it still it still gives you a nice curve you don't have any problem but the right way to do it is what you do is you take a cautery mark you mark along the center of the medial femoral condyle and match your pegs to that onto that line then you get a proper rotation but even if you have 15 degrees external internal rotator mm-hmm. it's okay it's forgiving okay. in the oxford i mean not in the other fixed bearing ones there you have to be very precise Thanks. Are you taking any extra measures in fixed bearing other? Uh, nothing, ma'am. Um, as I said, my fixed bearing experience is only with the robo. So with the, robo. the main, yeah, the main measures you take in a fixed bearing is central tracking of the implant. That's very important. You don't yeah. have that worry in a mobile bearing, and you can't really do that tracking properly in a conventional fixed bearing, because wherever the cut comes, you have to put it there. But now with the robo, I can actually medialize and lateralize my implants just to get a proper tracking. Do age has a role in planning uni? Maybe above six, uh, below sixty or above sixty? Yeah. So there's a bimodal distribution. Younger patients, it's a good option. Younger patients anyway because they can get back to all their activities. And later on, fifteen twenty years later, if this wears out, they can go for primary TKR. So you've actually saved them twenty around fifteen twenty years of. 
you know life before getting a primary care older patients again it's very good much less morbidity much less mortality 30 minutes you're in and out you're not taking out any unnecessary bone so it's a bimodal distribution less than 50s and above 70s are the ideal guys uh, sir how much you consider about the pedal of femoral arthritis before selecting the patient for the not too much if you have medial facet arthritis to an extent i really don't mind i'm still doing unis they say that the biomechanics of the knee get corrected so it reduces the load on the pedal femoral joint but if you have that arthritis spreading towards the lateral facet and it's almost like going to stage 3 stage 4 then you try to avoid it and as i said a lot of surgeons are now doing bi compartmental they do the uh, the medial compartment and they also replace the patella femoral but mm-hmm. i think that's a bit of overkill mm-hmm. in that state just go for it etr is my thought process in this case sir you need do, do you don't uh, do any medial release not at all you should no, not no. you only raise that small triangle on the anterior portion of the tibia that we normally raise that small triangle that we raise yeah just bit of the deep mcl i don't even go to the mid coronal pain just that small triangle so you can place your jig on top of it that's enough nothing more than that should be released if you are having to do any medial release that means it's not a correctly indicated case but can it can it any time be done for a lateral arthritis yes it can so Uh, lateral unis are very very common in europe especially uh, but in india what we found i've never seen an isolated lateral compartment unit till now uh, lateral, lateral compartment arthritis osteonecrosis right? yes that that is one indication but it's rare i have not seen those either i've seen one case which is also medial uh, usually our lateral arthritis are associated with inflammatory arthritis is what i have found in india valgus knee arthritis Yes, ma'am. But most of our valgus knees are because of some inflammatory pathology. So you can't do uni in those because they will spread yeah. to the other compartment. If it yeah. is isolated, just lateral compartment arthritis, they are much more common in the Western population, Caucasians than us. Sir, is uni a substitute to STO? We can no. say <laughs> that's the slide I show. I don't know if you saw that slide. Yeah, yeah, I have seen that slide. Yeah, it's not a substitute. There are different. indications for each it's better to know both or if you don't know hto send it to your hto colleague if you find so if you have a medial arthritis in a very young patient without bone on bone arthritis okay without bone on bone wearing out and uh, and with some extra articular deformity that's more of a choice for hto if you have a little older patient physical. yeah with more uh, age more bone on bone arthritis okay and uh, no extra articular deformity that's more of a chance for a uni so i think the clinching factor is bone on bone arthritis if it's bone on bone go for a uni you still have good gap there but still lot of pain go for an hdo uh one more question sir for example yes, sir. In, in uni if you have unexplained pain which you are not able to explain with any uh, thing in the x-ray how many months do you wait before converting it to tkr very good question because uh, uh, yeah the very first case that we revised of a uni was my own patient the one which i told you we could convert to a primary tkr that lady came within 3 months saying i still have pain and uh, we were also not too sure because it is one of the early days and uh, her another surgeon told her no you should have gotten a total knee so she got us she made us revise it then we when we opened we found it to be a perfectly done joint there was nothing wrong then i went though we revised that case we went back and read the literature some papers show most of these guys they recover within 1 to 2 months actually there's a subset of patients it takes sometimes 4 to 6 months for the remodeling of that medial metaphysis to happen because all the weight is on the medial condyle right so sometimes there's a subset of around 10 to 15% i mean not even 10% maybe less than 10% of patients who have a little bit of prolonged pain so you should wait at least 6 months if everything else is good wait for 6 months for the remodeling to happen reassure the patient usually the pain would be 75 to 80% reduced it's just a last 10% and then somebody would have told them nay nay you should have got it totally that's when they come back so you just hold hold your horses for another 1 to 2 months after 6 months is still having an issue then just get rid of it but up to 6 months you should wait for remodeling to happen Thank you so much.
Adarsh, suppose after cutting, if you feel bony porotic, you have any extra keel length uh, tibial uh, implant? Actually, good idea, ma'am, but no, there's nothing like that. There is nothing like that. Okay. <laughs> it's a good idea. We can give that as a design uh, suggestion. <laughs> Okay, good presentation, others. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So okay. If you have any doubts, please feel free to get in touch with me. I will share that video of uh, our revision of a regular, that one case which we revised to a primary TKR. I'll share it in the group sometime. What I'll also do is I have a full-length surgical video of uh, Oxford knee as well as a robotic partial knee. I'll share those links on the group uh, sometime tomorrow. If you can just remind me on the group. I'll share those links on the group. I have it on my YouTube channel. I'll share them with you. Good others. Well, well presented. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Good. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to reach yeah. out anytime if you want to know more about the unis. So, okay, Kushal, is that all today? Yeah, I think yeah. he left just now. It's all for today. Yeah, uh, yeah. Bone defects, Ratnakar was supposed to do today, but he's got some family issues, some personal issues. So, he said he'll call. He'll get back next week. Uh, good. One question, uh, sir. So next Friday class will yeah, be happening sure. because we have Indian Orthoplasty Association conference in Chandigarh also. Next Friday. That's next okay. Friday, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you're asking yeah, yeah, right. something. Yeah, sir. Uh, this same case which I uh, shared the X-ray. Uh, did you get a chance to see the, that X-ray, sir? Which one? Yeah, are you X-ray, yeah, Oh, your stress okay. fracture. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely mid sharp. So I think probably you have to put a plate, open it separately, or extend the incision, do a nice compression DCP plate, and then put a normal knee. Oh, okay. Okay, okay so you don't need any extra rods for this. Because no. your rod will not be able to negotiate that. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. first fix the, the plate, and then put a normal knee. Okay, the first fixation, first should be the fixation. Yeah, fixation. Okay, okay. But yeah. then uh, how much uh, it should be four uh, screws up and four screws below? Or no, no, three, three. So six cartridges on either side should be all right. Three okay. screws and on the top, three screws in the bottom. 4.5 uh, LCP. Yeah, just like any other tibial shaft fracture. Yeah, but it should not interfere with the tibia, with the tibial implant, right? No, it, you, it won't because you got enough space there. That's what I'm saying. That's why okay. I put the regular implant. You don't need to put any extra tibial rod. Right. So, but uh, you're saying that I should do the plating first and then proceed for the yeah, TKR. Yeah, put the plate first. Yeah. Okay. okay. Because okay. if you manipulate this for a TKR, it's going to extend your fracture. So, you okay. fix it and then go for your TKR. Okay. okay. Right. At the most, if you can defer the top screw, wait for okay. some time, put the yeah. knee replacement and then you can put the top screw. And uh, it should be the same incision or should I take a different incision for that? Same incision should be fine. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just a small point on this kind of case. So we, I had a case like this rheumatoid lady who had exactly same, but the fracture is a little higher up. I asked my trauma colleague to do the proximal tibia. Sandeep knows this lady very well, Padma. So yeah. the trauma surgeon did a medial incision. I took a midline incision in the same sitting. That was a mistake we made. Uh, the skin got completely necrosed. So probably... Mm -hmm. We should have just continued that incision up and just curved it slightly. That would have been a better option. So, so you yeah. can put in rod the garbage. Uh, you no, can that put was in a rod. Yes, yeah, so I'm the this same incision, go down. midline incision, slightly curve it medially. That's enough. Yeah, that's what. Try not to use the two parallel incisions. Yeah, yeah. Don't take. Yeah. yeah. The stress fracture itself says the bone is porotic. So, exactly. primary knee without rods, is it justifiable? Actually, my patient, I put a rod also. No, it but as here well as it is mid shaft others. So, that's yeah, why yeah, the yeah. rod is not that That is a proximal rod. tibia. The patient yeah. I was talking about is a proximal tibia. Yeah. It's almost a mid shaft. But uh, is there any harm in putting a rod as well? No, no. no. Come no, in the no, way of the plate. Long rod, you can put the rod, but here it is neither here nor there. So best is put okay. the plate and put the normal along with plate. the plate. Along with the plate. No, it's that is the normal procedure. If you got a upper to upper TV fracture, but here it is. Right. You just you just cannot put a rod right up to the ankle. There are no rods like that. No, no. What I'm saying is plating 
as well as a this small rod to give a bit of osteoporosis support no 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 what i'm saying your rod cannot reach the fracture or negotiate no, i'm not talking about for that fracture in general we put rod for osteoporosis patients yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but we put that this thing that's okay but here the top plate screw will come into the way of the right. tibial rod okay yeah. so don't make it complicated regular re plate go home and uh, the mobilization should be delayed or uh, what about you can we can partial mobilize it next day uday no issues okay but well, i know uh, okay and then, because i plan to do it uh, like uh, uh, first i'll do this side the fracture side and after two days i'll do the other side that's what i planned you can do the same on both say both on same city you don't need two anesthesia for that it is just another 30 40 minutes procedure you ask your trauma colleague if you are not too comfortable no no i am comfortable with plating i am a trauma i am orthopedic oh, surgeon then that's fine wonderful nothing like it yeah, yeah. okay yeah. but uh, ambulation should be like uh, with a walker or maybe partial weight like that yeah walker partial weight bed right right yeah okay thank you guys thank you yeah. thank you sir bye bye good night good night bye. thank you sir good night good night thank you sir good night thank you sir good night bye bye, bye. Hi Manoj, Bob, how are you? You are a sprite boy. గిరి గిరి చెప్పు